It is my distinct pleasure and privilege to welcome you to Virginia Wesleyan University today for this important event and conversation. A very special thanks to Admiral Lee Gunn, one of today's panelists, chairman of the Gunn Group, our partners in hosting this conference, and really please join me in giving a special hand to Lee. He is the driving force behind the program that you're going to see today. For those old movie fogies in the group, he's our top gun. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> Thank you as well to our esteemed seminar panel members, uh, David Archizel, Doug Beaver, Dr. Sweta Sharkabardi, Cameron Evans, Andrew Holland, Dr. Maureen McCarthy, Ann Phillips, Ashley Rohrman, and David Tidley. I'd also like to thank the organizations who participated in our Green Career and Volunteer Fair, and of course our sponsors, Huntington Ingalls Industry, Newport News Shipbuilding, Fairlead Integrated, the Marine Technology Society, and the Oceans Conference and Exposition. As you know, around the globe, young people are joining scientists, governments, and environmental organizations to understand and address climate change. We're here to work together in preparing students and younger generations to lead or support this effort at the local, national, and international levels. Perhaps not since the origins of Earth Day in the 1970s has there been student activism on this scale as our planet faces new and ever more urgent threats. Our focus on the environment continues to be a priority at Virginia Wesleyan University. We are one of 448 colleges and universities in the Climate Leadership Network, an organization for which I serve as chair who is taking action on climate and preparing students for the future through research and education to solve the challenges of the 21st century. As signatories of the climate leadership commitments, we have as our goal to become carbon neutral by 2040. It's been a privilege to combine my experience leading other institutions into action and my passion for environmental stewardship allowing me to recognize how significant and successful our program truly is. Now I'd like to bring up Lee Gunn to lead off our program. Thank you again for coming and hope you enjoy the program. I can't tell you how happy we are to be here. Um, the great thrill of this, of course, for us who've been putting it together and working with Professor Malcolm and the many folks around the university who've welcomed us, has been associating with the students. And so uh, several months ago, we decided that it would be great to have an opportunity to talk with you um, about the things that are going to affect you profoundly and about which we still have some influence and can bring that influence to bear to try to make situations better for you. Um, the university is a place where this kind of learning needs to take place. The university is a, a spot where young people need to uh, begin to understand in earnest what uh, they have at stake in the future and that their voice in a democracy such as ours can be and must be counted. <clears throat> so pardon me, I, I hope that Away from this afternoon, you take several important points. Number one is that, that you are vital players in a drama that's unfolding before us in which a couple of acts have already been performed. And so it's dreadfully important that the final act, the one where we actually make the changes, bring about the technologies, develop the approaches and the policies necessary to control the environment in a way that allows this wonderful green planet upon which we live, this wonderful blue planet upon which we live, uh, continue to sustain the kind of lives that we have all enjoyed and we hope you enjoy as well. So we have a couple of sessions this afternoon, a couple of panels. We decided early on that we would call this entire um, event, which began on Wednesday with uh, Dr. Um, uh, Maureen McCarthy from University of Nevada, Reno, 
uh, talking about complex world issues with a classroom of about 50 students and continued this morning with classroom sessions with three groups of students in their classes that were relevant to the kind of issues that we're talking about. And in every case, we, we put some of our invited speakers with those classes in hopes that a conversation would emerge that would be very valuable to you. And I think in many cases it has been. We hope to continue that conversation this afternoon with some of those same people uh, being here on the stage. Um, can we go past the, uh, there we go, okay. Uh, we tried something different um, because your student voice is vitally important. And so for about 10 days, a couple of weeks ago, we launched something called a Waggle Pulse. A Waggle is a device used uh, to answer uh, questions from the wisdom of the crowd. Uh, many times people will wonder, what do our blank think about this? What do our students think about this? What do our employees think about this in business? Also, what do our customers think about this? What does our faculty think about this? The answer is in the group that you're talking about. It sometimes doesn't emerge because some of the best ideas are among those people who don't have the loudest voices. But a waggle is intended to solicit from all participants ideas in answer to a question, and then to allow everyone who participates in the waggle to do a pairwise comparison, eventually voting, um, in our experience, the very best ideas to the top of the heap. Um, these are the top five uh, answers based on all that voting uh, to the question, which aspect of climate change affects you most and why? So they were, and I've, I realize this print is small, so my uh, shorthand for that is, number one, people tend to react to trigger events and we're concerned that it's going to take some serious trigger events to ignite the kind of interest that's demanded to make real change in coming years. Number two is governments are inactive. At least our federal government at the moment is relatively inactive. Number three is emissions were not slowing enough and the carbon persists long enough in the atmosphere that we're already consigned to a degree of climate change that we're not very comfortable with. Number four is sea level rise and extinctions are, on the one hand, uh, almost inevitable, and on the other hand, uh, something we have to prevent, um, even though some organisms are being extinguished right now. And five is people and businesses resist change. That is, our personal habits are going to be difficult to change. I put those up because as we go into the first panel um, with, that's moderated by um, uh, Dave Archisel, retired Vice Admiral Dave Archisel, the former commander of the Naval Air Systems Command, the former president of a shipyard here in the Hampton Roads area and someone who's been a leader in these advanced policies for years. And Dr. David Titley, uh, who is a panelist who has flown in from Dallas to join us because he wanted, like the rest of us, to be involved with students. Um, he is a retired vice admiral and he was the navigator of the Navy and the oceanographer of the Navy is a genuine client scientist. And so we're very fortunate to have him here. Uh, Andrew Holland is the chief operating officer of the American Security Project, a centrist think tank in Washington, and he deals with policy. Dr. Sweta Chakraborty uh, is a, a, a scientist in the human area She's a social scientist and she works very much on the messaging and the convincing nature of what the arguments have to be about climate change. And finally, although I think he's going to be first up, is Cameron Evans, one of your students here. And Cameron is from Tangier Island. And of course, he has a life story to tell since he's one of the 500 remaining occupants of that island. Um, very quickly before the panel comes up, or as the panel comes up, Arch, you want to bring them up? Um, we are going to do another waggle pulse. Uh, at the end of this, of this panel presentation, there's going to be a 20 minute break, 
And I'm going to come up and ask you to haul out your phones at that time, and we're going to put a question up, and I'll show you how to, how to get into the Waggle system to answer that question. And we're going to try in real time to take uh, uh, to test the waters here, as it were, uh, and see how you feel about the, uh, the issues that are in those questions. So without further ado, over to you, Arch. Thank you, Lee, and good afternoon, everyone. I feel like I'm in... Uh, a ready room of aviation squadron, or at sea, or a church. Last rows are few, are, are full, and the front pews are empty. So make your way down to the front if you'd like. There's plenty of seating up front. Um, Lee contacted me a while back and asked if I would assist him in putting some of this together. I really paid a very, very small part. But the part I did play, one, I want to make this point clear. When you talk about the importance of these kind of issues, they, do, they are very important to industry. They're also very important to something called the maritime. Hampton Roads and the maritime cluster has no greater focus or importance than on this very issue. And some of the sponsors you see today, Huntington Ingalls Nupunu Shipbuilding, fairly integrated, have, in fact, uh, piers and, and space on the water. And they have to make sure, they want to make sure that they exist here in Hampton Roads, right? So they're obviously interested and very dedicated in everything that they're approaching. So I think I want to dispel the rumors right up front to say that industry is not interested in this issue, but it's not just their issue. It is the maritime, to me, the maritime ecosystem and the maritime cluster of the region that has to understand the importance of it. Anything that touches the water is important to that group. So um, today's uh, panel has already been introduced, and I'm delighted that Lee took that for me, so I don't have to worry about that. And I've told the panel I really don't want to spend time uh, trying to introduce them, but they will take some minutes just to introduce themselves as they go forward. I'm just going to go down to each panel member one by one, and then what's important I ask you now is to think about questions and answers. You know, the worst thing that can happen at the end is we say, okay, any questions, and there's a death silence. So... <laughs> I'm counting on this group to really start thinking about now, think now about what questions you'd ask, and then be prepared because this group, I guarantee, is not going to be shy to answer when it comes to uh, questions posed to them. Uh, so please make your way up and be ready to sing out the questions. So let me begin today, this discussion now with the first panel I'm, going to, I'm not going to introduce, but to talk to and give the mic to, which is Cameron Evans. Now, when I flew for the Navy back in the day at Pax River, Maryland, as a test pilot, where I would fly over these three islands in Chesapeake Bay, which everyone, we used to identify and sequence by blood, sweat, and tears, because it was Bloodsworth, Smith Island, and Tangier Island. And uh, at that time, that was back in the day when, 1975, we had discussions then about the uh, erosion uh, around those islands and what was happening. And today, I regret to say it isn't getting better, but I'm going to have Cameron talk to us about what it's like to live there. He's a photographer that makes his, he lives there. He's going to go duck hunting soon. He's going to tell us all about that maybe, but more importantly, he's going to tell us about what it's like to be around Tangier Island. So over to Cameron. Thank you, Mark. My name is Cameron Evans, and I'm a sophomore here. Know pretty much most of y'all, <laughs> but um, I'm from Tangier Island, Virginia, a small island only about a mile and a half long into the middle of the Chesapeake Bay, but it's still about 15 miles away from any other piece of land other than Smith Island, Maryland. So I grew up working on the water pretty much as a young kid, eight or nine years old, and I started to see how my island was pretty unique and, and com wasn't really comparable to any other place that I knew. So growing up, I saw that everything was getting smaller. The people were getting older and the business of working on the water wasn't necessarily getting any better due to different laws that were being passed to prohibit the catches. So. Pretty much, I saw everything was changing from the beginning. Going out in the boat, I always saw how the lands were getting smaller, and I noticed that 
if something wasn't going to be done, that pretty much it wasn't going to be around for generations past me to be seen. So every year we lose pretty much 20 to 30 feet of land on all sides except our west side, which a jetty system was put in 1989 and has completely protected that side and we haven't lost one foot of land since. And we're trying to get money from other places to try to fund a sort of system to where the rest of the island would get protected too. So in 2012, under Governor McDonnell, we were appointed around um, $4.6 million, and it was supposed to be made on the northwest side of the island. And it was supposed to be finished in 2017, but when it was time, the money was depleted and it never got started. Well, fast forward a couple years later to 2017, we were funded $2.6 million, and it was supposed to be finished in 2018, and it never got started. It seems like it's always the same thing to where the money always disappears, but it's always a lot of things to look through with different laws to why nothing's getting done. It'd be easy if we were to put rocks all around the island, but the money is just not there. So in Virginia, we have different laws to where we can't use land restoration due to dredge spoil and pumping it back onto the land. And that's one of the biggest reasons why we can't get it protected. So just for instance, Poplar Island off of Baltimore, at its lowest, it was 50 acres. And now, after putting $700 million into it, it's over 1,600 acres. And in the future, they could put up to $1.4 billion and it could end up being over, well over 2,000 acres. Yet no people live on that piece of land. It's made only for wildlife and for, to provide an ecosystem. So I thought maybe we could do something like that. Yet we have 450 people and we have a lot of animals and we have a lot of ecosystem that we could rebuild to make a better place on the island. But it's all not, easily done. So we continue to talk and in the future we hope that we will be protected to sort of form a future for our people living on the island. But in 2000, at the end of 2018, we were appropriated $2.6 million and next month is supposed to start. So I hope it will start and we will get the help that we need for the future. Thank you, Cameron. Appreciate it very much. Now, I know there's a lot of questions for Cameron, but just take them, write them down, because we're going to call on you to ask those questions as we get through with um, the rest of our panelists. The next panelist I'm going to introduce is a longtime friend and associate. He was the weather guesser of the Navy, as we mentioned. and. Uh, He's, he's got an incredible amount of information to share with you and a passion you'll clearly see come forward. So let me introduce uh, Rear Admiral Titley. Bill? Okay. I'm that, sorry, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Usually I'm called Black Cloud, so, yeah, there you uh, go. so that, that's, that's better. So uh, first, I want to congratulate all the students who uh, got, got an award, got a certificate, and uh, hopefully there's some, some money that's associated with that at least someplace. If there isn't, go see your administrators, and I'm sure they have extra money they can give you there. So there, now that I've made myself popular with the leadership of the college. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm basically, all you need to know about me is, yes, I ended up in the Navy for about 32 years, and I'm really a recovering weather forecaster. Uh, so I kind of come at this from a pretty much practical uh, viewpoint, and climate got added as the Navy started looking further and further ahead. Uh, I think at one point I was supposed to talk about science. I'll be happy to do that in Q&A, because, spoiler alert, this is not really about science. This is not a science issue. The science is cutting edge 19th century science. We know it really, really, really well, kind of like we know gravity. Uh, it's sort of that way. You don't see people saying, I don't think I believe in gravity, so let me step off a six-story building and see what happens. We don't see that. Uh, so we know the science. Now, if, if anybody, again, has questions in q and I'm happy to talk about that. But what I think I'd prefer to spend a few minutes talking about is maybe 
some things that maybe not everybody's heard, like why did the Navy get so involved in this so early on? Uh, and what, what should we do? So really what happened was back in 2007, when probably most of the undergraduates were in elementary school, uh, the Arctic experienced really the first collapse of ice. And what that did was that generated a lot of conversation to the head of the Navy, we call the Chief of Naval Operations, on what we should do, all the way from nothing to, oh my God, this is a huge thing, to everything in between. So what do you do if you're running a really large organization and you have this problem that people keep bugging you with, that you're not quite sure what to do and it's taken up a lot of time? You find somebody else to put the dot on their forehead. And that was me. Now, what really helps in the uh, Navy is it's a hierarchical organization. What does that mean? That means if your boss is interested, you are? Fascinated. Fascinated, exactly. <laughs> so, the head of the organization is now interested, so it becomes pretty easy to start, start moving this. The corollary to that is leadership counts. I would not be on this stage if it wasn't for Admiral Gary Ruffett, who was the head of the Navy at the time, who said, hey, we need to look at this. So basically, Admiral Ruffett asked me what we should do, and the bottom line was we need to concentrate on the Arctic, but the Arctic is just really a harbinger. It's a leading indicator of many, many changes to come that our Navy and our defense forces are going to have to deal with. And that's why Admiral Ruffhead accepted the recommendation that we stand up a task force on climate change, Navy task force on climate change, which we did uh, just over 10 years ago. So that's, that's really how this got started. It was because we saw a change in the environment that happened to be pretty far away from here, but we said, you know, this is going to be an issue. And I told people back then it was not a crisis. Back in 2009, it was a challenge. But if we waited long enough, it would become a crisis. So we're in the waiting game right now. So that's, that's how that works. When I take a look at what climate change means to me in broad terms, in three things, three words, people, water, and change. This is not a polar bear issue. This is a people issue. It's about you and me. It's about our neighbors. It's about people in our town, in Norfolk, at our university. It's about the people in our state, people in our country. This is going to affect, either directly or indirectly, every single person here and every child and every grandchildren, child at least, that you have. This issue is not going to go away anytime soon, and we are going to manage it one way or the other, or it will manage us. It's about water. It's about having too much or too little, wrong place, wrong time, salty where it should be fresh, wet where it should be dry, liquid where it should be solid. The very chemistry of the oceans, as you, many of you are studying here, are changing. That impacts food webs, which in turn impact how we feed billions of people on this planet. And then finally, it's change. I mean, I come from Pennsylvania, from Penn State. You know, it's not like we have ideal climate. Uh, we don't see the sun basically between November and March up there. Nobody would claim that's ideal. But what we have had is climate stability. And we've had climate stability really since the dawn of human civilization. And I would argue that is not coincidental. We in fact have built human civilization on this implicit premise of climate stability. And now, due to our burning of greenhouse gases, or burning of fossil fuels and the greenhouse gases, we are changing the climate faster than we have ever seen happen on this earth. So how are we going to deal with that, with you know, seven going to eight, going to maybe nine billion people? That is the change part. It's either gonna be a bumpy road or it's gonna be a lot worse than a bumpy road. So on uh, the military side, how, you know, if you're in the Pentagon, if you're talking in the defense establishment, you may hear some of this from, from Andrew or from some of the other panelists, but again, I really look at things in threes because I can only remember three things in threes. Uh, first is it changes the operating environment. You know, as the Arctic ice melts out, that means that you're going to need different training, 
different ships, potentially different uh, types of ways of operating in the Arctic. You're going to need to train for that. You're going to need to think about logistics and bases and all of this. Uh, in the United States, as you can all imagine, we are not interested in a fair fight. We want to make sure that not only we know, but our potential adversaries know that we are number one. So don't mess with us. So we want to make sure that if that operating environment has changed, that we send our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines into that uh, theater with the very best equipment tuned really for that new environment, not for what might have worked 40 or 50 years ago, but what's going to work. So we need to look at changes in the operating environment. The one, of course, that is near and dear to Norfolk here is threats to our infrastructure, threats to our bases and training ranges. And of course, we have uh, the sea level rise. You're all very aware of that. Uh, I just gave a talk at Offutt Air Force Base a couple of weeks ago. They had a over $1 billion freshwater flood there. So while we think about the coast, these, uh, these issues of threats, either from floods, droughts, fires, are certainly not just the coast. Because if we don't have our bases, we can't be ready for that potential fight. And then finally, we look at the geostrategic impacts. And again, I'm happy to talk more about that in, uh, in Q&A. Uh, it is not as simple as something in climate happens, therefore a, a country falls apart. It is a much more complex issue than that. But if you think of sort of a link of a chain of events or dominoes, if you will, that's a little simplistic, but it kind of gets the point across that climate change can be one of the contributors, and if you could take that out, you may have much, much less of a problem than if it stays there. So what I tell people is climate change can make a bad situation worse, and sometimes catastrophically so. So those are the three ways in which climate impacts uh, security here. No, I'm not playing with my phone here, but if you sit up on this stage, and some of you guys will get to do this at some point in your career, there's no clock, which means I could talk for about three hours, but I'll try not to do that. So I, I've got about another 90 seconds here. So I said, okay, this is not about science. What is this about? It's about messages and messengers. It's about trust in tribes. It's about values. You know, when we talk to people who, for whatever reason, don't really want to get on board the train of fixing this, it's probably because we're really rubbing hard against somebody's values. So I've, I get a lot of people who want to, quote, debate me on the science. Uh, and pretty quickly, you know, you get to say, it's always a guy, right? So you get to say, look, you're not Einstein, you're not Galileo, you're not Newton, you're some dude living in your mom's garage, usually. Uh, so what is it that scares you so much about this? Because other things don't seem to scare you, probably things that should scare you aren't scaring you, like those three packs of cigarettes a day you're smoking. <laughs> so what is it? And it's either, I don't want to be regulated by the government, I'm afraid you're going to make energy really expensive and I can't do the things I either have to do or like to do, or my job's gonna go away. And then it's like, okay, now we can talk about that. But don't pretend that this is a science argument, okay? So let's actually figure out what common ground we can have on these and how do we move forward together. So I'm gonna pretty much stop at that part. I am really, really happy to see everybody here. Because I'll tell you, uh, and Andrew can certainly comment on this, that in my view, the Congress is not going to lead us out of this, but they can be led. And you know who's going to lead them? The voters. And if you guys and gals vote, you are then part of the solution. So uh, that bottom-up approach, ultimately, hopefully with some fairly smart things coming top-down, but really the bottom-up approach ultimately is going to is going to drive this. We have seen rapid change in our country before on issues we thought were intractable. Uh, it can happen again. I think it will happen again. And uh, it's going to be driven by you guys. Because I'll just tell you one, one last thing. The ICE does not care who is in the White House. It does not care whether a Republican controls the Senate or a Democrat controls the House. It just melts. And it's going to keep melting until we do something about it. And that something is going to come 
from the next generation. And that's why I'm so happy you guys are here. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Dave. So just for a time hack for our panel, we're, uh, we're 30 minutes from, uh, we have 30 minutes to go. So there's no, there's no pressure on you, you got plenty of time. No pressure, and, uh, right? Famous last Andrew, uh, the next person I'm going to introduce real quickly is Andrew Holland. He's going to, as mentioned by both Lee and Dave, he's an expert when it comes to um, the ideas of energy, climate change, and infrastructure policy. And I just want to turn it over to him for his comments. Admiral, thank you. Uh, and, and I think that's a great segue from Admiral Tit Titley over to, to me to talk a little bit about uh, policy and politics. Uh, I, I actually thought it was really interesting when Admiral Titley said, you know, the story starts in 2007, because that's about the same time it started for me as well. Uh, I was a, a staffer on Capitol Hill at the time. I had just been given the energy and environment portfolio. Uh, and uh, one of the first things that happened to me was this big stack of reports got dropped on my desk. And this was the IPCC report. Uh, so for those of you who know, the, the International uh, Governmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, it's a big UN convened panel of scientists that assesses where the current understanding of science is. And so 2007 was the fourth assessment report. It gets dropped on my desk, and here I am, you know, 20-something staffer, know some things about policy, know more things about politics. And I get to reading through it, and wow, there's a lot of, lot of scientists here. There's a lot of data here. There's a lot of stuff here. Maybe there's actually something to this. Maybe there's actually something to be aware of here. So, so I quickly called in a lot of the smartest people in Washington. Turns out in Washington, if somebody from Capitol Hill calls you, they usually come. Uh, it's a great, great way to, to uh, get people to, to come and talk to you, and, and everybody wants to tell, tell things to Capitol Hill staffers and their bosses. Uh, so, so I quickly learned a lot. Uh, so what I'm going to talk here about, though, is the policy, uh, where we are and how we got here was, was the title of the panel. So I'm going to talk some about national policy, and I'm going to talk some about international policy. Uh, and all of that is grounded in politics as well. Uh, so on national policy, going back, we've known about climate change at the national level since uh, Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon Johnson got a, a NSC report saying, uh, National Security Council report saying that, that the accumulation of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere is likely to have some effect on uh, the weather. Uh, so that, that's over 50 years ago, that they were starting to be aware of this, starting to know that it was an issue, something to, to, to think about and worry about. Fast forward then to uh, about 30 years ago, uh, that was the beginning of the, the, the Rio Earth Summit. Uh, you can go back and see uh, they, were, they were starting to talk about this. Al Gore was starting to, to hold hearings. They held a hearing in, in Capitol Hill in 1988 uh, with uh, Jim Hansen, a, a climate scientist, to talk about uh, the, how, how climate change was real and it was happening. It also happened to be on one of the hottest days of the year. They opened the windows. This is kind of a famous story, but uh, you know, the, the thing is, is that people cared about climate change insofar as they felt it. And that's, that's often been a problem because it's not perceived. Uh, and and uh, Shetta is gonna talk more about this in, in terms of the beha behavioral aspects. But in terms of the policy, uh, there, there had been a lot of talk about it, but you know, not too much action, not too many votes, not too much stuff going on, uh, and uh, that that started, you know, it started back up again in, in the early 2000s uh, with the introduction of some bills in the Senate. Uh, Warner, uh, John Warner, there was a Warner Lieberman bill. Senator John McCain, uh, McCain Lieberman, back in 03, 04. These were the, the, the beginnings of the national sort of response to this. And, and these responses are market-based responses. Let's put a price on carbon. Let's uh, think about ways to, to cap it, uh, put a cap on it, and then trade it in a way to make it more efficient. 
uh, and we can go into these 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 bills and where they went. Uh, the answer is they they didn't go anywhere uh, because the the political divide became more and more political. In the early days, the votes kind of broke down based on. Uh, where your district was. Was it a, an energy producing district or was it a coastal district? But within several years, 10, uh, 10 years or so, it became a political issue. And, and I think that's the most important thing to, to realize, that, that climate change didn't, wasn't born as a Republican issue versus a Democratic issue. It wasn't born as a, a partisan issue, conservative versus liberal. Uh, and if you travel around the world, it's not necessarily a, a conservative versus liberal issue. Uh, there are plenty of, of conservative governments around the world that take action on climate change. Uh, but here in the United States, it, it kind of became that way, and, and that's the way it, it broke down, so much so that it, it changes from a, uh, an argument about how do we find solutions to, as Admiral Titley said, you know, this is going to hurt me, and, I, and I'm afraid of it, and therefore I'm going to start fighting it. Uh, so, so I think it's, it's important to kind of get back to a place where we can talk about solutions instead of talking about this, this political space. So, so to kind of pull us up to, to where are we now in terms of the national conversation, we're in an unprecedented space, actually. Uh, and, and the 2018 elections really showed, I think, for the first time, that voters actually cared some about climate issues. Voters actually voted based on climate issues. Uh, and, and, you know, and, uh, why is that? A couple of reasons. I think, I think one uh, is, uh, you know, the old saying, events, dear boy, events. Uh, things are happening. Uh, seas are rising, fires are becoming more, uh, more apparent, droughts are happening, uh, you know, people are on the move because of, of these droughts, and, and that's impacting how people respond to it. Uh, when you see, you know, a, a, I'm from the, the New York area originally, when you see a, uh, a hurricane go up the coast and then take a hard left turn into New York Harbor, into the Jersey Shore, that's something that, that's unprecedented. We had never seen that before. Uh, my parents had a, a tree fall in their house that, in that storm. These things, I events uh, have, have a way of changing minds. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think that's, that's an important, uh, important key, key thing in there. But also, you know, I think people became aware uh, it, it's an easier uh, sort of media narrative when when there's there's so opposing sides uh, and and you know when when one side is in favor of action and one side is not uh, it's it's easier to kind of get that media narrative out there so uh, I do think that there is a uh, uh, an, an opening for for climate action it's beginning to happen and I say this as, as somebody who, who's worked in Republican politics for my life uh, there are actions that, that Republicans are taking and, and are working on and and that's because of uh, people caring people asking about it people voting on it but also people uh, taking action not just at the ballot box because the things that happen, for the two years between votes is as important. Calling, you know, showing up at at, uh, at protests, going out and talking about it, and and, and every, everything like that is just as important. So uh, we have we have time. There's there's things that can be done, and you know, uh, we actually. Uh, I, I'm going to close here with kind of a note of optimism. Uh, you know, here in the United States, we've been given a, a bit of a I don't know, reprieve is the right word or something, uh, because nationally, we're actually going to, we, we pulled out of the Paris Accord, uh, officially sent, sent in uh, paperwork earlier this, this week, but we're going to meet the target. We're going to meet the target that, that the Obama administration set in 2015. And that's, that's partially because of policies that were put in place during the Obama administration, during the Bush administration before that, uh, but it's also partially because of markets. Uh, and markets are moving. Uh, right now in the United States, 
we're using about 25% of our electricity is from coal. That is the lowest percentage of our electricity use uh, since the 1920s, so over 90 years. We had, as, as recently as 2007, when I was working on the Hill and, and Admiral Titley was, was being tasked to start up Task Force Climate Change, uh, it was 50% of, of American electricity was from coal. And that's not because of some you know, political war on coal, that's because of markets. That's because uh, solar has become cheaper. That's because wind has become cheaper. It's very importantly because natural gas has become abundant and cheap. So you know, these things are happening and markets are driving it and uh, you know, policy's on its way and, and I think policy can, is going to be necessary to move it beyond where we are now. Uh, internationally, the, the, the market pressures are happening the, sa the same way. Happy to answer questions about that and, and you know, the Paris Accord and all that sort of stuff as well. I think that's enough for me. Uh, look forward to your questions and, and uh, thank you all for being here. Really, really important to be with you. Thank you. So Andrew, um, thank you for the opening comments and uh, just so you know, I got a notification from our august leader that we you gained us 15 more minutes back. He gave us another 15 minutes, so we're looking great. <laughs> um, my last name is uh, Archizel, not the easiest to pronounce, right? It comes from Uchitzel, which is Russian for teacher. And as I thought about our next presenter, and I was going to introduce her, I said, I don't want to get this name wrong. So if I get it wrong, it's because my last name is Archizel. I'm going to make that excuse, but <laughs> Dr. Shutta. Uh, Shakar Bordi is um, our next speaker. I listened to her in the classroom today, and I tell you what, I was, I was just blown away. I thought how interesting it was to listen to her talk and talk about cognitive behavior science as a cognitive behavior scientist and identify directly with the students and the faculty within that room. So uh, I think it's a real treat for you to hear from her today, and I'll turn the microphone over to her. Thank you. I'm going to need you to introduce me everywhere now, going forward. <laughs> that was perfect pronunciation of my name, and that was glowing, so I appreciate it. Um, I was also purposely sitting here so I wouldn't have to see you signal to tell me to stop talking because there's nothing scarier for a scientist than a moderator that keeps to time. We like to ramble. Let us have our moment. <laughs> but that's what I'm going to talk about, is communication and how critical it is to get communication accurate and to the point and expressed in a way that your recipient audience interprets it as you intend it to be received. And that's not the same for everyone. The ultimate failure we've had in this climate policy polarization and debate um, for as long as I've studied it is a failure in communication because we have disseminated information top down as scientists in one kind of one package without recognizing that there's so many different types of demographics out there and interpretations, innate values, trust, and we have not respected those differences, and that's why we're in this polarized climate. So I study this through the lens of behavioral science. How many of you in this audience know what that is? Are somewhat familiar with it? Okay, for those of you who don't, behavioral science encompasses a lot of disciplines. It's a relatively new discipline. It comes from psychology, behavioral economics, neuroscience, cognitive psychology, and together, individually, none of those disciplines can explain the phenomenon of human behavior. But combined, and with this uh, research and collaboration across all of these different disciplines, we've come, across, we've come up with behavioral science. And this is not to be confused with behavioral therapy, which is when you sit with a counselor and you have structured sessions. I am not a therapist. Do not tell me your problems. You'd be <laughs> shocked how many times I get questions in Q&A. That's personal. We're talking about the climate. It's a collective issue. We're going to solve it together. So... The reason I study behavioral science is to really try and get to the bottom of what's going on here. Why, despite having all the best knowledge, are we still ignoring this overwhelming problem that really, in its worst case scenario, might just wipe our species off the map, right? The reason for it is actually relatively simple. We are innately wired. Our brains are not too different from the dawn of our species. 
We haven't evolved fast enough to catch up to the risk environment that we find ourselves in. And it's worked really well for the majority of our existence in that our ancestors would see a snake or see a tiger and their immediate response because of the way our brain is wired and processes risk is to run away, is to fight or flight. And anyone who didn't do that, we are not descended from, right? <laughs> so this is where our brain still exists and we resemble closer to where we need to be really if we're going to address the really complex risk landscape that we now find ourselves in. We're not supercomputers, so we cannot, all the inputs that are coming in, we're looking at artificial intelligence, we're looking at cybersecurity issues, infectious disease, food security, water scarcity. It is so complex of an environment that we have created through human ingenuity and progress, but we can't process it. It's a lot, it's overwhelming. So when that happens, what ends up happening is we either shut down or we reach for some biases that allow us innate sort of characteristics that we have is what I mean by that, that allows us to protect ourselves from the uncomfortable reality of the risks that surround us. When we start to come up against anything that challenges that protection, we experience what we call cognitive dissonance. And that's what is that uncomfortable feeling you get when the existing narrative in your head is um, put up against or challenged by new information, right? So I'll give you a personal example. I apply behavioral science to communication. I do a lot of media. And I was on um, the Bill O'Reilly show. And Bill O'Reilly asked me um, about climate change, and there's a clip, it's about 10 seconds, of him agreeing with me, which I love to share, because if they can take clips out of context, so can I, and I love to be able to show a conservative you know, talk show right-wing host like him saying, okay, I agree with climate change. I'm like, victory. So what happened after that interview was a lot of backlash, right? I've got tons of death threats, um, I was told to go back to my country, the foreign state of New Jersey. I experienced a lot of what I, as a behavioral scientist, recognize as cognitive dissonance. And that's okay. Rather that, right, than no response at all. Because to overcome some of that barrier, you're going to get, that's going to be the natural reaction that people have. They're going to push back against you. So now some of you might be thinking, oh, I'm immune to this. I'm rational. I don't have these innate biases. So let's try an experiment, okay? I'm going to give you two risks and think about what the annual fatalities are with these two risks of last year. So the two risks are death by radon gas exposure versus death by gun, gun homicides. How many people think there were more deaths by radon gas last year? Raise your hand. You can look around. Okay, and how many of you think it's more deaths by gun homicides? Raise your hand. It's radon gas. You shouldn't be surprised that I was doing sort of a brain trick here. And the reason here is obvious, right? We are conditioned to retrieve information that is easier and more salient and more sexy and in the media and propagated. Those are easier for us to remember and process. And because of that, we attribute more frequency and probability to it versus something like radon gas, which you're, a lot of you here are hard scientists, so you might actually know. I didn't know what that was. Most audiences I come across are like, radon what, right? And But guns, you hear about all the time. So it's not surprising that this is one example of many of why we find ourselves in this situation where we are not aligned to the reality of what is going on. This is one example. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to keep it at that. I just want you to recognize, as we get into this conversation, that something like climate change, the reason we're here, is because this is a slow-moving threat that isn't, we, it's hard to imagine it hitting us immediately and as extensively as it will. It's far in the future, it's not in my backyard, it's not really going to impact vulnerable populations, so people think, and when in fact vulnerable populations are getting hit the hardest. These are the challenges that we are up against with this particular risk. That I, that I look at in great detail. And the way to overcome it is to come up with effective communications that address that discrepancy between the reality of the risk and our perception of the risk. We need to overcome our cognitive limitations and really identify how to effectively create the message, as Dave was saying as well, 
um, and find the right people to communicate that message. It probably shouldn't have been me on Bill O'Reilly. I don't look like the demographic that I was communicating to, right? And that's okay. We need to understand the right person to send the message because it's that trusted communicator, not what they're saying, because there's a lot of people communicating a lot of crap and people believe it because they trust or they like that person. So keep that in mind as we move into Q&A and we can talk more about it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Shetta, very much. And uh, now, if you all got your questions ready, if you would raise your question, um, I think there's some microphones that are going to go around, so please don't be shy. Uh, ready for questions? I see a hand in the back, so we'll take them as we get a microphone to you first. Yes, ma'am. Hello? Okay. Hi. Um, my name is Anitra. I'm a sophomore here at Virginia Wesleyan. Um, my question is for you, Dr. Shvetka. Pretty good. Shvetka. Yeah. Um, so with people like Greta Thornburg who are trying to, you know, get people to recognize climate change and all of that stuff and, like, the way she gives her message kind of like blaming the the older generation and the boomers is that an effective way to talk about it because you were saying like people talk down to other people so is that really effective is she hurting her cause rather than helping it that's a really good question. I've gotten that question. I also work with a group, We Don't Have Time. It's a, it's a website and an app. I encourage you all to look it up and play around with it. It's totally free to engage with. It's the app that launched her. They took a picture of her, the one holding the sign in front of the Swedish parliament, and it went viral. We have now the technology to really harness um, a lot of these campaigns and uh, projects and initiatives that are underway, whether it's you're looking at activism, whether you're looking at technology and solutions that can be scaled, or whether you're trying to shame a company for uh, bad practices that aren't sustainable, there is an opportunity to use the technology to really find collaboration at a global level here now. Um, Greta Thunberg, I think, is extremely polarizing. I think if it wasn't Greta Thunberg, it would have been somebody else. It happened to be her, and then people got behind her. She wouldn't be doing, or who she was, if she didn't have the following. So we needed a symbol, and she is a symbol of that sentiment, that extreme sort of liberal left as it's um, accused of being sentiment, and it, 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 it is not gonna be helpful in terms of polarizing. That being said, it is extremely helpful in terms of getting that groundswell that we need to actually move the needle, because we do need bottom up as much as we need top down, and this is getting to that tipping point, and Dave and I, and we've all been talking about this, what is it gonna take to really push that needle? I think it's gonna be something like these, this type of extinction rebellion activism um, fight for our Fridays, or whatever exactly it's called. And I think there's a lot of potential there for this to also be positive. Dave. I'll just add, I agree with, with everything there. W one of the other things I think you see in behavioral science is sort of this idea of, you know, where the anchors are and sort of if you think of like on a sports field, like where are the guidelines, where are the sidelines of the field? So you listen to some of what Greta talks about, and it can sound kind of extreme, well, the thing that now makes, and you think of like the Green New Deal, sort of in the same way. Now things like, well, geez, innovation and maybe stricter standards on uh, fossil fuel emission and you know some, some dates to go carbon neutral by 2040, 2050. Hey, that sounds pretty reasonable. Whereas a few years ago, it's like, oh, that's wacko talk. We can't, we can't do that stuff. But now if you sort of like, it's kind of moving the goalpost or whatever analogy you want to use. And I think Thornburg is, is being useful in some of that. But I would absolutely agree. There's, uh, you know, it, it, there, is, there is friction there as well. But, but moving this so that what used to seem radical starts seeming mainstream may actually be pretty useful. Yeah, and just to add a little bit more, uh, in politics, passion probably matters more than numbers. Uh, numbers only matter once every two years when you get a vote. The passion is what gets people to, to think about an issue, gets policymakers to act on it, gets po it moves it up the priority level. Numbers only matter when you get a vote, uh, but for all the 364 other days of the year, it's, it's the passion is what, what drives political interest and activism. And I think that's, that's an important thing that she's, she's adding. 
and uh, and actually, you know, the the numbers on the other side, it's not like you have to convince everybody in behavioral science. Some people you just have to beat, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think, personally, another comment you had there, though, was I would be very careful not to stereotype every age group or every... We tend to do that, right? Yeah. That you think this way, and therefore yeah. the whole generation that you're with. That's not the case. And uh, people have the ability to, at all levels, at all age groups, to think about these issues and, yeah. and contribute that thought. So, um, the great question. No, other question? Um, over here. Uh, I had a question pertaining to like um, climate change. Um, we, I think, we all know here, you know, climate change does exist, but there's also problems associated with climate change. Uh, Dr. Titley, uh, he brought up the point of people are scared of losing their jobs as we transition from non-renewable to renewable energy sources. Um, my question is geared towards Titley and Andrew Holland: is what, what is solutions proposed to effectively um, transition to from, from non-renewable to renewable energy sources. You mentioned how we've l used less coal, but in addition, we've used more natural gas, which is a non-renewable resource. So mm -hmm. I'm just curious about that. Okay. I'll, start, sure. I'll, I'll take a start, and it may not be the answer you want to hear. Uh, the danger is, is as you end up with a microphone in your hand and up on a stage, is if you're not careful, you start drinking your own Kool-Aid and actually think you know what you're talking about. Uh, so asking climate scientists or retired naval officers or guys who drive their 30-foot Airstream around the country, like how we should transition on this is a little bit like asking your plumber to design your house. You certainly want him involved in the process, but maybe not the answer. So I think these types of, and I think they're, and I think these kinds of, of questions, like how do we do this transition in a way that is seen, I'll just say is seen as just, let's say by, by the majority of Americans is, is seen as just and fair, because there are going to be dislocations. There always have been, right? But this is going to be one that we sort of do to ourselves, because we know if we don't do anything, the, the results are going to be a lot worse. Uh, and this is where the conversation needs to be in, and the right people need to be at the table. So is it elected leaders? Is it tribal officials? Is it representatives of, of affected groups? And it's easy to think of coal miners as an affected groups. Well, what about... Uh, what about people who have sort of lived with the effects of coal and breathing that coal dust? Usually uh, less economically advantaged, people of color. You know, so there's a lot of people who need to be at that table and have this conversation. I, I mean, if I knew what the answer was, I probably wouldn't be sitting here because I'd be a whole lot richer. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what the answer, what the specifics are going to be. But these are the kinds of questions we need to be asking as opposed to, oh, it's cold outside, therefore climate change isn't happening. You know, that kind of silliness. Uh, and, and I think this really has to be done in a way that is seen, is perceived as fair. People may not like it, but you, you'll, you'll see as you go through, through a lot of life. If you have a process that is seen as fair, it's like, hey, I had my say, I was able to influence it. I, I'm much more willing to then abide by the outcome. And, and these are going to be tough, and that's, but I think that's what we need to do. Thanks. So uh, a couple things to add. Um, there's, there's policy ways to deal with this. Uh, it, you, you have to trust that the policymakers are working in your interest. But that, this is kind of the basis of the Green New Deal, right? The Green New Deal idea is that this is going to be hard, and it's going to cause pain to some people. So if you actually read through the, the, the legislation that's the Green New Deal, most of it isn't about climate change or emissions. It's about equity stuff. It's about job guarantee. It's all that sort of stuff. So that's, that's kind of one way of, of dealing with it, kind of that, that, that way. Another policy option for dealing with it uh, that I think is quite elegant uh, but again, this is kind of my, my way of coming at it, is, is this idea of a carbon dividends thing. So it, you put a price on carbon, a, a carbon tax, and then uh, you take all that money that comes in, and then you send it right back out. You send a dividend check to every American uh, of, of equal amount. So it, it, you know, 
this is actually how Alaska does their uh, their their dividends for oil and gas revenues. So every every citizen of Alaska gets a check every month, certain amount based on how much revenue they've pulled in from oil. We could do the same thing nationally. Uh, and in that respect, probably about 80% of Americans would end up getting more money in that dividend check than the, the amount that their energy prices go up. So it would only hit the, the top highest uh, energy consumers. Uh, I think that's a good option. Uh, I, 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 I think it's quite elegant. The third way, though, to think about it is, is that this, uh, this doesn't have to be a negative sum or zero sum thing. You know, this kind of, the idea that we have to share the pain somehow. Um, this should be a, a, an idea uh, about sharing the prosperity, you know, because actually a, a lot of the, uh, the clean energy jobs, the, the, the clean energy transition is about moving to something that's better. It's an economy that's better, that's more, uh, you know, more equitable, that's got more money coming into it, that, that's about scientific leadership. It's about the, the jobs and, uh, and, and things of the, the 21st century, not the 19th century. So, you know, I, I think it, there's ways to, to share the prosperity as well. So, thanks for your question. Right here, uh, there's one right there. Okay. Yeah, greetings. Uh -oh. We'll feed back. Yeah, Don Park from Richmond. Um, yeah, I kind of, uh, it was a hot button for me to hear Dr. Sherratt's Borg talk about uh, pro the difficulty. <laughs> Are you going to send me back Dr. to Dr. S is fine. Okay. All right. He did better than I did. But he, uh, anyway, the difficulty of, I was in marketing and uh, uh, in psychology. And I, sir, I, it was kind of a hot button for me to hear about your mentioning people having a difficulty of processing complexity. And I, I related back immediately to marketing class at University of Richmond. In the first chapter, uh, they asked Texans to hand draw a picture of the United States and draw Texas in it. Well, they drew Texas as <laughs> one third of the size of the United States. <laughs> what concerns me from a marketing standpoint I don't think people really understand the scale. I'm sure you're all aware here, many of you, Dr. Roger Revell in the 50s at Oxford. He is the gentleman, the scientist who coined the phrase global warming. And also he affected and inspired Al Gore and he inspired um, Pat, Dr. Patrick Moore who started Greenpeace. Well, these scientists, they were familiar with the scale of things and they were very upset. No question, from the, the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, the earth has warmed uh, and they were quite concerned about it and started these movements. But as both the founder of Global Warming and Patrick Moore expanded their research to more than just the 100 to 150 years from the beginning of the revolution, and look back more than 100 years, they found out that over 10,000 year span, in a 100,000 year span, in a million year span, that there are ice ages every 90,000 years, right, Dr. Titley? All right, so absolutely, you know, I, the, does the climate change over time of tens of thousands, hundreds, millions? Absolutely. It's called the Milankovitch cycles. It's very well known. Uh, that's what drives the Ice Age. If you really want to watch a good way to see that, Google Richard Alley Congress Milankovitch cycles because he has a nice big bald forehead and he explained to members of Congress how this works. It's the difference in, in the orbit, or sometimes more elliptical, sometimes more circular, and the tilt of the Earth. That's all interesting, but it has nothing to do with the fact that the sun's energy over the last century or so has actually been decreasing, going down, and we measure that, okay? When I had to form Task Force Climate Change, the first person I talked to was in fact not a climate scientist, it was a sun scientist. Because, hey, if the sun's getting warmer or getting stronger or the Earth's orbit is changing so that we're getting more energy from the sun, well, it kind of makes sense as to why we'd be warming. That is not happening. Okay, it's just simply not happening. 
So when we take a look at why we're warming, this science traces back to the early 19th century, back to 1822, and what we see is that there are certain types of gases, uh, carbon dioxide and methane among them, that trap energy in the lowest part of our atmosphere, in the first few kilometers of the atmosphere. And we know, thanks to Keeling and others, that those numbers are going up and up and up we know that it's not just recycled, but it's actually really, really old. I call it dinosaurs, it's not right. dinosaurs, but it's really <laughs> old carbon because we can measure the molecular composition of that carbon dioxide. If you want sort of a smoking gun, you look at not the warming of the earth, but you look at the cooling of the upper atmosphere because again, the sun is not giving us more energy. We're simply redistributing how it is and it's colder. And this is where sort of you look at the overwhelming evidence. And this is why about 97 or 98% of practicing climate scientists see that the warming is explainable and it's human cost. We can also predict it. You look at James Hansen's models that are published. You can go to the library here at Virginia Wesleyan, pull out the 1979 versions of Science Magazine, find Hansen's article he published and he showed where the earth was going to be temperature-wise in the year 2010, 2020, 2030, if anything, we're actually a little bit warmer than what Hansen was showing. So we can predict it, we have overwhelming evidence, and we understand the physics. We absolutely understand why those long, long-term changes happened. But what we have done is in the last 8,000 years, we've had climate stability on the top in between the ice ages, and during those 8,000 years is when we have actually built human civilization. We have built human civilization on this premise, this implicit premise of climate stability. We are now changing due to human causes, and we've derived great benefits from energy. I'm not saying that we haven't. We've derived great benefits from energy, but we now understand that that has come with tremendous side effects. And the side effect is, is we are now changing the climate as fast or faster than has ever been measured in millions of years. And our question is not, is this happening, but what are we gonna do? But that's, that's where we are, sir. Thanks very much. Yeah, yeah thanks for the question. Then we have time for, we do have time for one more question. So maybe um, up here up front. Go ahead and stand up, I think we can hear you. Uh, hello, my name's uh, Griffin. I'm a freshman here, and I'm actually in a social science class right now. So, I ca like the cognitive, dis cognitive dissonance and stuff, I was like, okay, I know that. Um, so, my question is uh, for you, Dr. Shweta, um, that for a lot of climate change deniers, um, arguably many of them are conservatives, and then conservatives, again, arguably have closer attachment to military and national security. And in the past couple of weeks in our honors course, we've talked about um, the risk of national security with climate change and that for a lot of deniers that the message doesn't get through to them. So is potentially changing the risk of climate change in a sense of national security purposes, would that serve to better um, help kind of show the risks to those kind of individuals who might not get it because it is not a NIMBY issue for them and changing it to national security would make it more BIMBY? Yeah, great question, and nail on the head in terms of the group that's here. We all are part of the Climate and Security Network, um, so that works out. We we really see the value in doing that. Again, it's who's communicating. The military is at the front lines, seeing it firsthand. They're putting their lives on the risk, and now we collectively, as a human populace, are making it the conditions even worse and harder for people who are voluntarily already putting themselves at risk. So it's a very compelling narrative from the front lines that really reaches a lot of those demographics that might otherwise not be swayed. I host the Climate and Security podcast for the Center for Climate and Security, where we're 15 episodes in. We've interviewed um, 
retired and active and various other stakeholders that take this climate and security perspective. And the response has been overwhelmingly positive in that sense. We're reaching those demographics that need to hear it from those that they trust and from those who really are putting themselves out there. Um, I'm sure that you might want to comment on that too, but that's exactly right. And it's, it's successful for the right audiences. But again, it's not one, it's not like a one type, one stop shop for everyone. You have to adjust and address the communication and who's communicating and who the message is, depending on who the target audience is. Somebody said earlier today, one of the students was like, does that mean for some demographics, it might be Kim Kardashian? Yes, it's possible. Maybe for larger demographics, it might be Oprah. It's all about who is trusted. You know, I, I, I'm, I'll just say, say a quick thing, because uh, the American Security Project, we, we do this as well. Admiral Titley, Admiral Gunn, others have, have gone around the country with us to, to talk to, to various audiences about this. Uh, but what I'd caution about is, is don't, uh, we don't do this for the meta reason that it communicates well. We don't do this for the reason that we're trying to, to reach some, some meta audience or something like that. If you do that, you, you kind of lose some authenticity. We do this because it is a threat to national security. Not because it's perceived as a threat to national security. Not because some people respect national security voices. But because it is, in fact, a threat to national security. And it is something that uh, we have to deal with now and we have to plan for. And there are some lessons we can learn for how the uh, national security uh, community is planning for it and is working for it. So. I'll just say I certainly agree with, with everything that's gone before. I will just tell you, since I have testified on this issue before, Congress run by both, both parties in various times. Uh, this is not a silver bullet. This is not a panacea. They don't say, oh, you're a retired admiral, therefore I'm going to listen to you and like what you say. <laughs> uh, I can't count the number of times of, admiral, thank you for your service, but you're dead wrong on this issue. <laughs> So what Sveta talked about, some of the ideology, tribal, if you will, you know, it's very, very hard to change sometimes your mindset, especially if you think you're going to lose your friends, you're going to lose your peers. It's easier to say, well, that guy clearly drunk the wrong Kool-Aid and, you know, he must be some outlier because I don't really want to change my worldview. And, but it can make people uncomfortable, as, as, as was talked about. And it can, it can, I mean, we also get people who says, you know, I never really thought about it, or I thought this is all a bunch of tree-hugging stuff, and you know, and you guys made me think harder. You know, if I can make somebody think harder or think a little bit differently, then I feel that's like a pretty good, a pretty good day. But it's not, no one audience, no one messenger is going to be the silver bullet. I, I wish it was, but I don't think that's going to happen. Well, I want to uh, please join me in a round of applause for our panelists. The remaining panel is going to talk to the degree we're able and encourage a conversation from you as well about what we can do together. I think that the first panel did a nice job of setting the stage, talking about where we are, uh, how something about how we got here. Um, what we're going to do now is I'm going to go over and sit down and I'm going to ask um, Ashley Rerman, uh, a student here of course, uh, and the president of Marlins Go Green uh, to talk a little bit about the student perspective on these issues and then we're going to stay in the more local area and we're going to ask uh, the uh, chief resiliency officer of the city of Norfolk, Doug Beaver, to talk a little bit about things that are more local but are of importance uh, governmentally and perhaps he'll also talk a little bit about the relationship among the variety of governmental agencies that are uh, present uh, here in Hampton Roads. and then. Um, we will go, he's by the way a retired Navy captain and former base commander uh, here. And then we'll go to uh, Ann Phillips, retired Rear Admiral Ann Phillips, whose last job in the Navy was as commander of Expeditionary Strike Group 2. All of the amphibious ships in Little Creek and, and Norfolk on the East Coast and the Marines that supported them as well. Uh, and she is of course the governor's uh, uh, Special Assistant for 
Uh, help me, Ann. Coastal adaptation and protection. Coastal adaptation and protection, certainly vital issues for all of us and really important to this. So we'll start, Ashley, with you. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you all for coming out today. My name is Ashley Rohrman. I'm 21 years old. I'm a junior here at Virginia Wesleyan University. My major is environmental studies and my minor is in sociology. And so the question is um, what we can do together. And I can speak on behalf of what I'm doing and also what I see on campus. So um, I'm part of the Environmental and Sustainability um, Council and that's for, with faculty and students, and we focus on um, innovation on campus um, regarding climate change and environmental initiatives. And I'm also the intern um, at Facilities Management, and last year we organized the first annual Earth Week, and this year we're doing the same thing, and um, we're going big this year because it's the 50th anniversary for Earth Day, and um, we also look at ways to involve students and student engagement. And um, also, Marlins Go Green, that's, woo, woo. that's um, one of the, that's the environmental club on campus. And um, this year, we've just won money for a campus garden. And with that garden, we intend to um, have like an open space where people can come out and kind of have a reprieve from everyday life and enjoy um, being outdoors and in nature. And we plan to um, have perennials, and, um, native species, and uh, pollinators. So we can get bees, birds, and people all in one place. And um, so that's, that's the process that we're starting. Um, in the past with Marlins Go Green, we've done cleanups and invasive species pulls and um, field trips, and one event we did was um, last year for voting. We partnered with Mar Marlins Vote to promote voting because that's like one of the most important ways to really make a difference with climate change, with um, policy, and when that's enforced, that really does make a change. So we were promoting that, and, um, and yeah, I've seen a lot of like passion and like activism on campus and it seems to be very inspiring like just everyone seems to be very involved and like engaged with what's happening in this world and it's exciting to see some change happen on campus with the little community we have but um it's exciting to be part of that so thank you thank you ashley Jeff? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Doug Beaver. I'm the Chief Resilience Officer for the City of Norfolk. And first off, um, the fact that you all are still here after a break <laughs> means you're the hardcore people who really care about this issue. So give yourselves a round of applause. Hey. So like the Admiral mentioned, I was in the Navy for 27 years and then uh, have been working for the city of Norfolk in it, uh, another capacity for the past two years and then in the past four months in my new position as Chief Resilience Officer. Um, and, and I can tell you, having worked at the federal government le level and then Department of Defense and now at a, at a local level in a place that I call home, I call Norfolk home, sorry, I know we're in Virginia Beach, but I know many of you probably live or, or uh, have ties to Norfolk as well. But um, th at the city level is really where the rubber meets the road on a lot of these issues, because uh, we're gonna hear from the state, and, and I think uh, we'll hear that money is tight, and in some cases it's non-existent for issues like this, um, but here in Norfolk, being sort of the ground zero next to Tangier Island, which is, you know, has struggles uh, even to a higher degree, obviously, than we have here in Norfolk, uh, we have the highest degree of relative sea level rise on the East Coast. Um, so next to New Orleans, we are experiencing the highest relative rates of sea level rise. So if, uh, as we heard in the earlier panel, if the polar, if the polar regions were the telltale signs of the rest of the planet, 
Norfolk is the signs of what the rest of the East Coast is going to look like in a number of years. So we're going to experience it sooner. So there, therefore, we have to be more proactive. Um, well, several years ago, the city adopted a, a, a resilient strategy, um, understanding this, this threat. And so we are looking in three different areas, breaking it down into our coastal communities, uh, the economy of the city, and then the individual neighborhoods. Uh, and there's two, two neighborhoods in particular that uh, we've been fortunate enough to receive uh, HUD grant money to go in and address uh, challenges in those communities through the lens of coastal, economic, and, and neighborhood development. The largest one we have is a $112 million grant to go into the Chesterfield Heights and Grandy, Villages, uh, Grandy Village communities right down off the Elizabeth River just past Harbor Park. Uh, it's a historic neighborhood. It has uh, public housing. It is susceptible to uh, high tide and tidal flooding as well as uh, significant rain events, water being trapped, and there's only really two ways uh, in and out of that community, and one of them essentially becomes impassable during high tide events. So with uh, this $112 million grant, we are rapidly moving to the implementation phase of moving some roads, uh, putting in pump stations, putting in earthen berms. When you put it in an earthen berm, you're essentially trapping that rainwater, if you will, so you have to have pump stations to pump the water um, out back to the, to the uh, Elizabeth River. And so this is a project that will go on for about three years. Um, and one of the key features is a resilience park. So it's essentially the straddling area between the two communities, the Chesterfield Heights and the Granny Village. So we're putting in a park that will be, uh, if you have a high tide event and a rain event at the same time, the park has design features for it to flood and then for that flooding when it subsides to it, it be a, a community uh, amenity, if you will, for soccer, for you know anything that you can imagine that uh, young families want to go experience um, in their community. And, and we're looking forward to that. The other area that you've probably read about is in the St. Paul's um, part of downtown Norfolk, the three uh, public housing communities that we're going in to redevelop. And, and, and really, the tagline that the city has taken is people first. So we've partnered with a company to go in and have individual counseling for families there as we go in and look at those three neighborhoods and go into Tidewater Gardens and, and sort of help that community transition uh, to with a voucher system to other areas as we redevelop those um, communities to mixed use retail, and there's aspects of Tidewater Gardens in particular that flood uh, quite frequently. That used to be a creek uh, 100 plus years ago. So we need to understand the hydrology of that region and that the Office of Resilience is helping with that effort, effort as well. And we received a $30 million choice uh, neighborhood initiative grant to go in and help that uh, community. Uh, but we also realize that the city as a whole has challenges, whether it's in Larchmont, up at the Naval Base in Ocean View. Uh, so we've partnered with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers for a coastal storm risk management study. And there are a number of initiatives, whether it's uh, a seawall or an earthen berm, or in some areas, if we want to uh, buy, out neighbor, buy out individual parcels or raise houses, um, there is no blanket policy per se for, for neighborhoods. Uh, we're taking it on an individual basis at this point, but we understand that there are some significant challenges in some of the neighborhoods that we have here in Norfolk when we have the sort of flooding that some of you remember just as little as uh, three or four weeks ago in early October uh, when we had some high tides. So I'm going to keep my comments very short because I think it's, uh, there were probably questions left unanswered on the first panel, so I want to get to those questions and hear what's on your mind. Uh, and hopefully be able to uh, keep it lively and, uh, and moving. So with that, I'll hand it over to Admiral Phillips. All right, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you uh, for being here and sticking it out with us. So uh, first, I'd like to thank our two student panelists who have been with us this afternoon, Ashley and Cameron. Thanks to the two of you for taking this on and having the courage to tell your story. 
um, to the crowd that really matters, and that kind of gets that to me to the heart of the issue, which is this is all going to be about communication, education, but communication. And I saw one of the waggle comments was, it can't just be bottom up, it has to be top down. Yes, but top down responds to bottom up. And so the community outreach and the actions of the community, the community members, the stakeholders, the people who are on the ground dealing with the experiences as conveyed to their legislators, to their elected officials, to their mayors, to their council people, uh, that finds its way up farther into the state government. I know, by the way, you can write letters to the governor. You can write letters to the state. You can call and express an opinion. There is a community services line that takes notes, answers your questions, responds to you. And those things are tracked every week. You should know that. Every week at the deputies meeting that I sit in when I'm there, we get a report on comments that have come from around the state on a whole host of issues, what they're about, who is responding, what the, what the kinds of questions are, and the volume. So you will get an answer, and your voice will be heard, and it will be reported. Uh, this is a valuable communications tool because I can tell you that the more times people hear the same message coming from the bottom up, coming from the community up, the more they tend to pay attention. A point of reference. So I've been at the state for a year. I'm a retired surface warfare officer, drove ships 31 years for the Navy. When I retired, I decided I'd go back to school and get a little more education. I went to William & Mary and got an MBA. And while I was doing that, I had an opportunity to work on a vol as a volunteer on a pilot project here in the Hampton Roads region, looking at whole of government and community solutions to dealing with climate impact, particularly sea level rise, on Hampton Roads. I was bitten by the bug. It seemed fascinating. There wasn't a lot of understanding. There seemed to be so much to be done, and, and there just wasn't enough action. And so I stayed with it. Worked for, with the Center for Climate and Security in Washington, D.C., nonpartisan uh, think tank looking at and talking about climate impact as a national security issue. It turns out one of the most compelling cases for that is right here in Hampton Roads, Virginia. Being able to tell that story resonated, and so I stayed with it. Along comes an opportunity to take this position with the governor's staff, and so now I have a new experience communicating as well uh, doing a lot of outreach with the community, the eight coastal planning districts that are considered coastal Virginia, which stretch from northern Virginia through Richmond, down to Hampton Roads, and up through the eastern shore. Three of those planning districts are rural coastal planning districts, Northern Neck, Middle Peninsula, and Accomack, Northampton County, which is the eastern shore. The rest are all what I would call urban, suburban, or industrial. The two that will be impacted the most and the soonest are Hampton Roads and the Eastern Shore. That should come to no surprise of any of you here, especially considering the compelling stories that you've heard this afternoon. So we have a lot of work to do at the state level. The state has been reluctant to take this on as a challenge that it must deal with near term. Uh, an awful lot of people in the state of Virginia, 5.3 million of them live in the Urban Crescent from Fairfax down to Hampton Roads. But all the rest live in the western part of the state, where they do, by the way, have significant flooding issues. Who knows where the greatest loss of life, not a very happy topic, but who knows where the greatest loss of life in the state of Virginia from flooding took place? Nelson County. Hi, Judy. Thank you for the answer. <laughs> Judy Hinch, ladies and gentlemen, and she is correct. Nelson County, early 60s, Hurricane Camille, 160 people died in eight hours. We received from 24 to 31 inches of rain during that period of time in Nelson County. Uh, so we have flooding program problems around the state in Virginia. The only town that's ever been relocated in Virginia, who knows where that is as a result of flooding? Judy? No? Grundy. App Appalachia, western part of the state. It was a riverine town, flooded out, almost demolished, relocated in a different location. So, two examples that the state should take heart and think about, um, that this is a coastal problem, but it's also a, rural, a riverine problem. This is a, f a rain problem, but it's also a sea level rise problem. And the point I want you to take away from that is uh, that 
we can make a lot of progress in the state of Virginia when we work together as a state to think about how this issue impacts us broadly and how we can move forward, but we do need to take action and start to move forward. So I think I will hold there and wait for questions. I can talk about executive orders and actions the Northam administration would like to do, but I'll wait and, uh, and take your questions. Thank you. Let me kick it off uh, with a, a question or two. Um, when the United States announced that we were going to withdraw from the, the Paris Climate Agreement uh, in 2017, uh, more than a thousand United States mayors wrote a letter to the conveners of that conference and said, we're still in. That became the name of the group, we're still in. Um, there are now 3,500 or more chief executive officers, mayors, governors, um, uh, other people at that level who have said, we're still in. Um, can you imagine how that the effect of that group could be brought to bear um, pointedly in this region and in the state of Virginia. Um, can you imagine how examples could be drawn from what is being done here and what needs to be done here uh, that would be impactful for this group of 3,500? So Virginia is still in and Norfolk is still in. Like there are five other cities, and I can't name them all. Blacksburg is one. I think Alexandria, Arlington, somebody fill in the blanks. Someone in the audience probably does know. There are a few others. Um, and so the way that is brought to bear is through talking about it and talking about the actions of those organizations, the actions when Doug, I'm going to pass it to Doug to talk about what Norfolk is doing in that regard. Um, but we have an opportunity now in Virginia, I think, to start to look at some of the broader climate actions required, particularly mitigation, reducing carbon emissions. We tried to get some progress and some traction with the General Assembly over the past few years. Governor McCall have teed it up, Governor Northam has carried on, and we weren't able to do it. We were blocked by the General Assembly by law. Um, there is some optimism that we may have an opportunity now to overturn that and to be able to move forward in that context. Uh, but I'd like to uh, let Doug talk about the things the city of Norfolk has done because they've been a leader in this area. Thanks. So it's funny when I tell people what my position is, they, they say, what is that? Chief Resilience Officer. And so I have to talk about, you know, it's, it's a reactive position that we deal with shocks and stress, stressors, and that's how we become resilient, whether it's a hurricane, whether it's a man-made uh, event such as a terrorist attack, uh, earthquake, or a fire. Um, but it's you know, my position is, is on the reactive side in many instances, and we're dealing with the, the effects of uh, on the back side of, of an issue. Um, so uh, the mayor and city council recognized uh, several years ago that to get on the front side of this, we needed to have a mayoral commission on uh, climate change mitigation and adaptation which was just, uh, their, their, they were just signed out their report in May of 2019. And so as uh, an, uh, one of the strategies of that is we're hiring a sustainability officer to get on the front side of this, which is mainly what this, this conference and this discussion today is, has been about. Um, so th that, that individual will come on board here shortly and be looking at um, how the city as a whole looks at energy use, looks at transportation, uh, building energy efficiency, and the sort of items that will get on the front side of this, uh, of the curve, if you will, not on the back side, which is mainly where, you know, in, in the Office of Resilience that we're focused on. But the, the, the mayor and the council members are keenly focused on this. There is not one uh, item that comes before council, whether it's an economic development issue, or a transportation or a neighborhood issue that, that, that the Office of Resilience and, and now the Sustainability Officer won't have a seat at that table because they understand the impacts of, of all our actions are, are felt across departments. So that's what, what's happening in Norfolk. Terrific. Um, let me, yeah, I was going to actually ask you a question, so go ahead, Ashley, weigh in. Well, I was going to say on the student level, um, with Marlins Go Green, we've participated in a climate strike and 
Um, we're promoting like student engagement, to go vote, be active, grassroots organization, just to show where your values are and, and what matters to you. So, you know, that the government and, and people that are involved and even just outsiders can see where your interests lie and what's important to you. So um, we're trying to like promote that within the club as well on campus. That's great. Um, a couple of questions quickly before we go to the audience. Questions about cooperation. The three, the three uh, cities, areas, regions in the United States that are most um, threatened at the moment by sea level rise are Hampton Roads, South Florida, and New Orleans. Um, in South Florida, there's something called the South Florida Compact, and the five counties in South Florida have gotten together and they've developed a concerted approach and they've adopted policies that apply to all. Um, and I'm wondering if such a thing exists in the Hampton Roads region, and if not, uh, is it practical to bring it together? And then I'm going to ask a question about cooperation across universities among uh, groups that are motivated, like Marlins Go Green. So could we ask about the, the governmental cooperation? I, before I took this position, I spent a lot of time advocating for exactly that in Hampton Roads, that there needs to be an intergovernmental process. Don't know how we're going to set it up. We have an example, the Hampton Roads Transportation Planning Organization and Hampton Roads Transportation Advisory Committee, um, HR TPO and HR TAC. The nuance is it's funded by Federal Highway Administration dollars. That's what pays for the staff for HRTPO. So what would pay for the staff for a regional uh, flooding resilience kind of authority? I don't have an answer for that question necessarily, although you can think of a couple of different ways we might be able to do it. So now I have um, eight coastal planning districts to worry about, and, and the challenge is to try to get all of them aligned and moving forward to the degree that they can and will based on the political nuances of what they must deal with within their planning and district and regional commission. And it is different. It is different depending on where you are. Some are much able to be much more proactive and talk about different things than others. These are just facts. So to me, if I can get them moving in any direction uh, that is positive, that's good. And so those that say to me, I can only talk about stormwater, I can't talk about climate change. I can't talk about sea level rise. Um, I say, great, let's talk about stormwater. Do you have stormwater problems? Oh, heck yes. All right, well, what can we do to help move forward in that context? Let's make some progress. And at the state level, that tees up Executive Order 24 and Executive Order 29. 24 is, is dictated at first setting standards for state-owned buildings and future construction. For what sea level rise scenario planning curves the state will use, which, by the way, the Hampton Roads Planning District has already made a decision there and already unanimously approved a series of planning targets for sea level rise for the future, and how we will elevate buildings uh, and to what level if we must build a building in a floodplain. And so we're working on an executive order now to roll those out. That was directed by Executive Order 24, as was the creation of a coastal master plan and strategy for the state of Virginia which we're working on and which will be based in this first phase on what the planning districts and regional commissions are already doing. And then finally to collaborate across agencies, stakeholders, federal partners, local partners to take what we have and what we are doing and move it forward in the best and most efficient way rather than everybody doing their own thing. Ex Executive Order 29 is, uh, solidifies the Council on Environmental Justice because environmental equity is absolutely crucial in this context. 60% of the homes that will be impacted by sea level rise across the planning districts and regional commissions in coastal Virginia are below the median home value in their region. So these are people who may not have a lot of extra income at their disposal to do things, so how do we help them gain access to solutions that will improve their situation and their circumstance and give them and maybe their locality a little bit more time to figure out what they want to do as they move into the future a future with more water in a, in, uh, as, as just a daily fact of life. Uh, I'll mention one area that we have partnered with other localities, at least in the uh, city of Norfolk, is through the Hampton Roads Planning District Commission, HRPDC's joint land use study that was just completed this past year, where this, these were federal dollars coming from the Office of uh, Economic Adjustment uh, to look at 
uh, the impacts of uh, mainly transportation uh, it, uh, problems arising from recurrent flooding and sea level rise for the Navy bases here locally. So o NAS Oceana and Virginia Beach, Little Creek, which straddles Virginia Beach and Norfolk, and then Naval Station Norfolk. So Naval Station Norfolk, 65,000 sailors, contractors, and, 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 and families uh, live and work on that base. And so if you ever head that way on a Monday morning with four carriers in port, you know how, how horrible traffic is on 64, 564, and Hampton Boulevard. So this, this study took a look at what needs to be done on those thoroughfares to make those, uh, those, uh, those more resilient, uh, whether it's uh, raising a road, uh, putting in more uh, pump stations uh, or uh, other improvements along along those corridors into what is you know 40 per 40 cents of every dollar here locally is is tied to a, either a federal dollar or a DoD um, uh, penny if you will of, of those um, 40 cents so we they we realize that you know we need to keep those those installations viable. Um, and so the joint land use study through the HRPDC was, was one area. But I think, you know, Norfolk's not gonna wait around for a, 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 a regional solution, but we understand the challenges of when we do a study and we just look at Norfolk that we, that Virginia Beach, Portsmouth, Chesapeake are all gonna be affected on what we do here. So, you know, that, that collaboration needs to happen and, and it, it is happening. Could it get better? Absolutely. I'm interested in intercollegiate cooperation in areas that have to do with this. Is there a, a relationship that exists or could exist between groups like Marlins Go Green here at Wesleyan and William and & Mary and similarly motivated students at University of Virginia? Could this be an intercollegiate uh, interest? And if so, do you have any, could you imagine how that could happen? Yes, yes, um, that is uh, certainly a goal that Marlins Go Green can like put forth and reach out to those um, schools. Right now, on a more local level, we um, have partnerships with Sierra Club, Lynn Haven River now, um, Elizabeth River, and um, we could extend that. I think that that would be very beneficial to see how other regions are affected. Of course, Norfolk and this Virginia Beach area is affected significantly. So I think that reaching out and seeing how other areas are affected would be, and, how, and explain how we are affected would be beneficial for all. And it would be cool to have like one big Virginia green club. That would be awesome, <laughs> united, you know? Be interesting to imagine what the, what the logo would look like. Uh, anyway. It would look cool. Uh, <laughs> questions? Yes, up here in front. Uh, the microphone's going to come around to you in just a second. I'm loud anyways. <laughs> um, my name is Jean Mahone, and I have a question for all three of you, answer as you may. Um, across coming in, I'm a freshman in college, and going through high school, environmentalism was never posed as a threat. No one was passionate about it. And I wasn't aware of it until I came into Virginia Wesleyan, who is very environmentally aware. So I guess my question is, are there any initiatives for the state or the local or the, the scholar level to educate the local populace on these environmental issues um, for students who may not be interested in it as a major, but would still like to take initiative and do their part. So everybody's looking at uh, me for the uh, moment. So, w, so from the K through 12 level, WHRO has done one thing and is starting another. They created an earth sciences curriculum, uh, which they were asked to do for K through 12 for uh, to give options to Virginia State, this is something that could be accessible across the state, to pull in, uh, if they don't have the resources at themselves at a, at a particular school or educational facility, they can pull in from uh, this broad network that's shared across the state uh, classes that have been recorded so that we can have a, and build an earth sciences curriculum and opportunity, and they are working on and or creating the circumstances to get started on an environmental science curriculum, uh, really focusing on environmental 
uh, stewardship, but, but also the science that goes behind it that could, to give a little more punch to that aspect of it. Um, so that's a K through 12 effort uh, that the local uh, rather substantial uh, radio, public radio and television station here in the Hampton Roads region, which is owned by 21 school districts. Somebody correct me if it's, it was 19. We just added, I think, two more. Um, uh, and, and so they have a high, uh, very, very strong focus on education, particularly K through 12. So that's a way to get the message out from an educational perspective uh, within the school system. Do you want to talk about the planning district? Well, I was just going to mention pass it the, to the uh, climate action plan in the city of Norfolk. One of their strategies is education and outreach. So if you go to norfolk.gov, Mayor's Climate Action Plan, it sort of lays out a number of five strategies and then a number of goals that are uh, underneath those strategies, and, and one of those being education and outreach. So that's, that's kind of the here and now of what's happening. The other thing I will mention um, that we've made available to individual you know, residents of the city is uh, Retain Your Rain program. So uh, it's a grant program where we'll go out and, and uh, we have rain barrels that we can, you know, donate to certain civic leagues and you know help install them and so just making that more personal we understand that there's some generational projects uh, infrastructure projects that are needed but really educating the individual uh, communities and the individual citizens and residents of, of what they can do to to help and that's what's happening in Norfolk and on, on a related issue the Hampton Roads Planning District has a major campaign going called get flood fluent um, which is really focusing on getting people to understand why they need flood insurance and, uh, and getting them to consider it and, and actually implement it if they live in a flood zone and, and they, they know they're eligible. But with that comes a lot of education about why it matters, what's happening, what the science is behind it, um, and what you can do as citizens to kind of improve your circumstances. So and yet, yet another program within this region. On campus, we have many environmental classes offered. Shout out to the professors. Um, and I like, one thing I like about the school is um, there are so many different disciplines, but the environmentalis environmentalism aspect is so like pushed. I think that it's important because climate change is not a partisan issue. It's, it's not, um, it's interdisciplinary. It's, it's not one group of people or anything. So that's one thing I like is I'll have an environmental course and there will be people that are business and all types of different disciplines. So um, there are a lot of options out there. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, right here. Hi. Um, you mentioned the rain barrel earlier. I was just wondering some other things that the average person could do in their life to, you know, help mitigate climate change. There are a host of them. Um, th the other big one that's uh, in the city of Norfolk as well is uh, plan planting your own gardens. So there's, if you go to the Norfolk.gov website, there's, you know, techniques and, and you can reach out to some of the other nonprofits that are active uh, in, the, in, in, in that ecosystem as well that have more concrete um, ideas. But the, the two that the Norfolk is working on is Retain Your Rain and there's a number of different uh, gardens, you know, home, home gardens, gardens in the back of your, uh, of your house. Um, those are the two that come to my, my mind, but if, if there's is others in, the, that you, in the context of best with. management practices that help retain water and slow down the outflow rather than just let it all run down the back of your yard. Um, so Virginia Institute of Marine Science has an extensive portal on uh, best management practices, particularly in the context of living shorelines and how they can be constructed and what the different types and options and challenges are. So it could help you think about, is that something that's appropriate for your for your property. Um, if, if you're interested in mitigation, of course, there's always uh, you know, drive less, walk more, try to take public transportation, something that's challenging in this region. I mean, it's challenging across the state, really, in a lot of, in many areas other than Northern Virginia. Public transportation is a challenge. I know there's a lot of work being done here in Hampton Roads to improve the bus system. Um, but, you know, when the, reducing carbon emissions is, is always uh, a personal choice, but it's a way to help kind of slow down what's happening here. In the context of retaining water, there's a number of nonprofits here in the Hampton Roads region. Lafayette, Wetlands Partnership, Elizabeth River Project, Lynn Haven River Now, Wetlands Watch, all of whom have websites that can talk about 
um, what homeowners can do to help maybe improve their own properties and ways that you can get involved in other community outreach uh, or projects that help improve, you know, create the same kind of circumstances and best management practices, but maybe on city-owned property or county-owned property uh, to just help uh, retain water or slow water down or divert it uh, or plant more native species, uh, encourage more natural and, and, and native uh, growth and activities and, and wildlife just to help create more of a, uh, a natural environment where that's possible. So, and then I think, um, you know, if you want to educate yourself, there's a whole different range of, you know, from the policy side, the American Security Project, the Center for Climate and Security will be happy to talk about uh, policy and, and national security impacts of climate change. And then certainly, um, I, I would just point to a number of the uh, universities who also have, you know, uh, Wesleyan is to be commended for their focus on environmental science. There is a need, a crushing need. Uh, really nationwide for people that understand this and want to work in the field and move it forward. So that's you know, a few little tidbits of information. And a broad spectrum. Okay, I have oh, good. Um, an idea as well. <laughs> so conservation, I think that that's a, a big way that you can kind of reduce your footprint on the environment, just use less because then you don't have as much waste. And I think in the American society, it's so easy to replace things that break and, and use so much. So I think conservation is, is good to keep in mind um, and just use less, less waste and more happiness, maybe. Yeah. Yes, back here on the, on the right. Do you think we can get any kind of major uh, like top-down change when any kind of regulations could negatively impact the organizations that more or less help fund the government that's making the regulations? Like, if it's a contradictory to their interests and values, what would make them, like, what's their incentive to make a real change from the top? I think at the state level, there's plenty of opportunities. Um, and the incentive is, you know, what we've been talking about here this afternoon and earlier today is what do the citizens want? What do the communities want? And what are they telling their elected leadership they want? So states still have a tremendous amount of power to act on their own, and, and many of them are, and Virginia is one of them, and we know we can do more, and, and uh, Governor Northam certainly wants to do more and push Virginia into a leadership role in this, in this context, particularly among southern states. But you're seeing, you know, I'll talk more about the state level, you know, we're seeing actions being taken in Charleston, in Florida, in Georgia, uh, in North Carolina, uh, states that um, in, have struggled in some cases to actually decide how they want to move forward on this issue, that they're moving forward. They realize they have challenges and they're taking action up along the Northeast Corridor as well. So it really comes down to capacity authorities and money, but um, states do have the ability to make some of those decisions themselves and to move forward, and, and we're seeing them do that. And I think it was mentioned on the earlier panel about how events, recent events, will impact policy change significantly. If you look at the earthquake out in California and then the flooding at two major uh, DOD installations, which caused over $4 billion worth of damage, uh, the policymakers will understand if you spend a dollar up front, that's going to save $6 worth of, uh, of, uh, of rebuilding and in, in complete overhaul on the backside. So it makes more sense. And, and so last year, the Department of Defense introduced the Defense Community Infrastructure Program. It was uh, authorized, but no money was appropriated. Um, we're hopeful this year that money will be appropriated. And if it is, uh, Hampton Roads and, and Norfolk in particular is poised with our joint land use study to go after those federal DOD dollars to help because uh, they understand it's the community that supports the installation. So if we're able to have the hospitals, the schools, the roads, the transportation system all be resilient, that will impact the readiness. So those sorts of events are, I think, maybe the shocks and stressors that the federal government needs to, to action. I might add that, uh, in my personal opinion, it's unlikely in the near term that we're going to get federal leadership on this issue. But that doesn't mean that there isn't federal participation. Data and information continue to come and, to con and continue to be accurate from the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, from NASA, um, 
The data that they're producing continues to make the convincing case over and over. Something needs to be done, but it also demonstrates the areas in which doing something can have the greatest effect. Um, in the meantime, the states, Virginia and others, are doing really important work, and they're doing a lot of it together. There's a 21-state compact now on climate issues and climate change. I regret I forget what it's called, but it was led by um, California and New York. They were the ones who assembled this, this uh, first a loose, a loose network, but now a degree of cooperation that we haven't seen, I don't think, uh, in my lifetime among the states on a particular difficult issue uh, like we have now. Um, I think that's going to continue to grow. Everywhere we go, I'm a member of the Military Advisory Board at uh, CNA Corporation, a research and analysis outfit. Uh, we produced eight reports now on climate uh, and national security, energy and national security. We go throughout the country and we talk to audiences of all types about these issues and about the, the national security consequences of ignoring them uh, and the importance to national security of dealing with them and dealing with them well. Um, by the way, all those reports are available on cna.org. Uh, it's a nonprofit operation. Um, wherever we go, we see a degree of cooperation welling up from cities and counties and regional outfits, and in some cases from electrical utilities and places where you just wouldn't expect this sort of ingenious uh, change to take place. So I think it's not as though we're without uh, motion. I think, the, I think the momentum is there. I think it's unstoppable. The question is, can it get the job done while there's still time to do it? And I think that's the really important issue. Are there any further questions? Yes, right back here. Um, I'm a sophomore here at Virginia Wrestling, and my question's for Ashley. Uh, so has Marlon, Green, Marlon, Marlon's Go Green, um, have they done any, have they like looked into or like done anything um, or are planning to do anything to help make recycling on campus more effective? Thank you for your question. That's a very good question. Um, we've been talking with facilities management and there are a few things that are in place to make recycling easier on campus. Um, one of those things is green bags. Um, to keep things organized, uh, we're going to use green bags in place of like the black and the clear. Um, I know that, that that's been a topic and it, you know, kind of like controversial on campus, um, but we're trying to find a way to make it easier for um, the management staff, student, and getting it to where it needs to be. But that's a good question. We're still working on it. Anything further? Well, uh, join me please in thanking our panel. And Before you all leave, I'd like to um, take a moment to thank President Miller for supporting this event. And uh, his commitment to the challenge of climate change is make a difference here at, at Virginia Wesleyan University and on campuses throughout the United States through his chairmanship of this leadership organization that's nationwide. I also want again to thank uh, Dr. Elizabeth Malcolm for her great role and great contribution, key um, work in making this today a success. Um, we'd like to thank our sponsors one more time. Um, they have helped us uh, defray the expenses for this. And um, the Green Career Fair participants on the uh, who've been outside, it's been great to have them there. I, I think they've been a, drawn for, a draw for students and perhaps we've been a draw for them. So I think that's, that's a, a terrific uh, kind of synergy. A special thanks uh, also from our team goes out to Sarah Sewell, the Lighthouse Executive Director, Jessica Harrington, the Director of Career Development, uh, Stephanie Smaglo, uh, Wesleyan's Assistant Vice President for Marketing and Communications, Tammy Doherty, Patrick Beard, our energetic uh, intern. He has been really super. Um, all along with us, and we really appreciate his work. 
Our amazing panelists again, the Green Career Fair participants and our student volunteers, people with the microphones and the like. So again, thank you all for coming. Please step, stop by the tables for the Green Career Fair on your way out and have a great uh, three-day weekend. Thank you.